Ladies and gentlemen, assalamu alaikum. My name is Kasim, and I welcome you to tonight's. Uh, there's a discussion. There's some demonstrations involved, but as you can see right here, it says that the name of our uh, event today is "Laughing Matters." Now, it's "Laughing Matters" is a little pun, as you can understand. <clears throat> But the important thing is that we're trying to have a discussion on how improvisation and mental health, they come together. Now, improvisation has mostly been linked to uh, theater and theatrical performances, in some cases, comedic performances. And of course, mental health seems a bit distant just by the natural sense of the word. But as uh, our notable guests here will, will make you understand and try to explain how closely these things are linked. And I'll just quote you a little example from uh, a workshop that we just did today at Berea University to the psychology department. And at the end of the workshop, we asked them what they thought about the workshop. And the first thing that the, one of the students said was they were amazed how closely humor can affect a positive mental attitude and can affect positive mental health. <clears throat> I'll just give you a little small introduction uh, about our panel. We have with us Dr. Jim Robinson. He's here all the way from uh, Minnesota in the US. He has about 40 years of uh, experience in teaching psychology. He has about 30 years of performing arts. He has been performing theater, professional theater, and he is a master in improvisation and how improvisation connects to mental health. And uh, somebody else who, I, who needs no introduction in Islamabad, she has been uh, the, the stronghold of theater in Islamabad, uh, the director of Theater Wale, and uh, she has, I mean, she has been teaching for 25 years. And there's a lot of theatrical contributions that go to her name. Please give a huge round of applause for Ms. Fiza Hassan. And I'd just like to call upon Jim at this point, if you could please start off. Sure. Uh, if you could just talk a bit about what, how you understand improvisation, how they connect with mental health, and maybe we could demonstrate a bit for our audiences, please. Yeah, the, I'm, I'm actually mic'd up, and I'm going to stand just for this part. Um, anyway, uh, it's as if I've never met you before, so we're going to pretend this never happened. But how many of you know, um, how many of you have been to an improv show? Well, huh. Oh, there's two. Good this time. That's good. <laughs> Great. <laughs> we did this before the filming. And um, how many of you have taken an improv class? Wow. Good. So we have a lot of people who are just beginning tonight. And thank you for coming. Um, as Kasim said, uh, my name is Jim Robinson. I'm here on a Citizen Diplomacy Action Fund grant. And the name of the grant, which we won't talk about a whole lot, is, is Supporting Community and Mental Health Through Improvisation. And I was really lucky in 2018 to come here uh, as a Fulbright specialist and to work with, with FISA at Theatre Wale and explore how the uh, skills that you use as an improviser can really also affect the skills that you use in daily life. Um, and this all came out of a project that I did where I used to teach in Minnesota, which was a class called Improvisation and Mental Health. And so the idea being that improvisation, which is about being in the moment and repeatedly finding yourself back in the moment, it's like mindfulness, it's like meditation, it's anything that, that brings you back into your body and back in the moment, how those skills are really useful, not only for dealing with people, if you're a, a doctor, a physician, a, a psychologist, but also uh, if you yourself, such as myself, sometimes struggle with anxiety or with other mental challenges. And so I was able to take this project and bring it here and work with some amazing people and also explore that. So what I thought we would do tonight, as Kasim said, is we're going to do a couple of demonstrations about how improvisation works, and then we will talk about how the skills that we used as improvisers up here um, can also contribute to mental health. And we'll be coming to you a lot because in improvisation, it's always collaborative and it's always inspired by the audience. And so if you would, just one more time, clap really loudly so that you can get your inspiration going. And I realize how pathetic it is to ask for applause over and over. Anyway, so I'm going to say very quickly what improvisation is. I said it's being in the moment. But we practice improvisation by using three really specific precepts, rules, um, guidances. The first one about improvisation is we always acknowledge the moment. Because improvisation is grounded in what's happening in the moment, we always acknowledge it. 
We always do. So, um, for example, uh, sir, I don't know your name. What, what's your name? Nautron. Okay, so let's say that you and I were doing an improvisation scene um, right now, and you were to come out on stage, and you were to say, hey, Dad, to me. I would immediately say yes. I wouldn't have to think about anything. I wouldn't have to judge it. I would just immediately say yes, and then we'd proceed from that point. And it's the same thing with anything in, in improvisation. If somebody says something, looks at us a certain way, gives us any kind of verbal or physical gift, we immediately say yes to it. And by doing that, we put ourselves in the moment. So we let go of our plans, we let go of all of our you know, narratives, our prejudices, anything like that. And it really does kind of set us free. The other thing too is we also say and. So if, if you say, hey dad, I can be any kind of dad I want. I can be an angry dad, I can be a loving dad, I can be a distant dad, I can be a dad who isn't quite sure who you are. <laughs> you know, I can do any number of things. But by starting with yes, we allow ourselves to really discover what the moment has. We don't try to create something, we just acknowledge it and then discover and work with that. The other thing too that's wonderful about, about saying yes, and you and I were talking about this earlier, is if it becomes a habit with, with you, if it becomes a habit with us, then we're much more likely to be ready to improvise in real life. When something happens, instead of pushing it away, which is what often happens in, in mental illness, pushing it away or wishing things were different or resisting the moment, which sometimes we do because we're human, if we get used to saying yes and acknowledging the moment, then we really have uh, the power to be in the moment, which is really the only place where we have power. We can't fix the future yet, and we certainly can't change the past. Does that make sense? Yes. The other thing, too, is that when you say yes over and over, when you say no, it genuinely matters. So in improvisation, we never do anything that diminishes another performer, and we don't accept diminishment ourselves. And if something doesn't feel right, we don't do it. But we don't fall back on no as sort of a, a, like a complaining kind of background noise. The second thing we do is we don't judge. We try to be curious, and that's an aspiration because human beings are judgmental. We are. But if you call me dad and I think, oh, why did you call me dad? Why? I would like for once you know, to be a, a pirate or you know, somebody's you know, romantic love interest. I'm always the dad. And I think it's because I dress this way and because I have this, this kind of almost angry voice. You know? And so the minute I start to judge you, the minute I start to judge somebody else, I'm thinking about myself and I'm not in the moment. The other thing too is in improvisation is we try to let go of judgments of ourselves. So if we say something that we don't like or something doesn't work out the way that we did it, we plan on doing it, it's because of us, we let that go. And we say, okay, I'm not gonna judge myself because we keep going back to the moment. And the last thing is that we see every moment as an opportunity, every single one. It might not be what we wanted, it might feel like a mistake, it can be any number of things. But that moment is the only one that we have. And so we tell ourselves over and over and over again, that we're in the best possible moment with the best possible people. And if we keep practicing that, we, we find that that's true if we believe it's true, if we can make it true, if we can uh, convince ourselves that we really are where we're supposed to be at that moment. Maybe not forever, but at that moment, that's where we're supposed to be. So what I thought we would do is we would do a demonstration, you and I, sound good? Sure. All right, and um, I'm going to take these stools out here. Would you mind putting that one over there? Thank you. And actually, why don't, if you, I'll put mine here, and if you put you guys, you got little little walking space between them, that's great. And and Kasim and I have been improvising for about forty five minutes. So. <laughs> Forty two. Yeah, yay. So um, as I said, improvisation is always collaborative. It's always based on the audience. And so we have two stools up here, and you're thinking, oh, I hope I get to sit in one of them, right? <laughs> that's what you'd like, yes? Right, good, you're an improviser. Get up here then, please. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's have, yes, sir, please, yes. All right, yay, all right. <laughs> if you would sit here, and then we need somebody, to, tell me your name again, so I sit. David. Uh, Daud. Daud, yeah. okay, Daud, okay. So, uh, do we have an empty seat here? Yeah, we do, and, and we, you wouldn't want to leave an audience member alone. You wouldn't want to be alone yourself. We use a lot of shaming in improvisation to get people to do stuff. We need somebody to sit in the other seat. Would somebody please be willing to do that? Yes, sir, come up, all right. Yay! And could you tell us your name, please? Uh, my name is Kaleem. Kaleem? Okay, Kaleem and Daoud? Is yes, that close? Okay, yes. I keep touching. Okay, so what's gonna happen is that Kasim and I are gonna, we're gonna do an improvised scene. We don't have anything planned, we don't know anything <gasps> about what it's about, and we're going to use Daoud and Khalid. 
Kaleem. Kaleem, I'm sorry. We're going to use the two of you as inspiration. And so as we are creating this scene out of thin air, occasionally we're going to turn to you for inspiration. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to touch you very gently. Is this okay? And you're going to fill in the blank. You're going to complete the sentence that I start. So for example, if I say, um, I love pizza, and whenever I buy pizza, I always have olives and ketchup. Ketchup. Oh, that's great. That's great. Actually, you have a little, here we go. So whatever, whatever my inspiration says, I repeat it, and then I use it. And then I go from there. So ketchup is perfect. Do you want to demonstrate with, with your source of inspiration? Hi, Galeen. <laughs> this is working? Yeah. There you go. So uh, every time I have to go to shop, you know, I take out my wallet, uh -huh. and I take out my credit card, and the next thing I take out is... The empty... The empty wallet. The empty wallet. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, yeah all right, good. Perfect. Great. And so whenever we, whenever we touch you, you will then fill in the blank, and we will take your inspiration, and we will honor it as a gift. Sound good? Yes. You have any questions before this happens? No. All right. Great. Uh, to get us started, we also need inspiration from you, since you decided to stay in your seats, which might have been <laughs> wise. Um, <laughs> Kasim and I, we have a relationship. Who are we to one another? Friends. 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 Okay. And how long have we known each other? 13 years? That's very specific. That's good, all right. We know each other for 13 years. Do you want to get a source of inspiration? We've known friends 13 years? Uh, can, you have, can, you give us, can you give us a location where we have met after 13 years? Islamabad. Anything more specific, maybe? Blackboard. Okay, <laughs> well, Blackboard. here we are, that's okay, the, yeah. That's the gift? That is, we really appreciate the gift. Thank, thank you, you, okay. So, so we're, we're friends for 13 years in Islamabad, at the black hole. And let's get one more thing, if that's okay with you. It's a very important day for the two of us. Something really monumentous is happening today. What is that? Anniversary. It's our anniversary of our friendship. That's perfect. Okay, good. You ready? Perfect. Here we go. Oh, I think we can walk here. We can go here. We can do anything we want. All right. Kasim, thank you for joining me. We met 13 years ago at the place where the black hole eventually was. And I want to say that you've been the best friend I have ever had. In fact, on the first day that you and I met, you gave me a book. A book. And I carry that book with me everywhere. And you inscribe something in the front and it says your your first visit to Pakistan. Your first visit to Pakistan. And to me I take that as a metaphor. What that really means is I want to know more about this country. I want to know more about this country. And here I am with you 13 years later with the book. Jim, you know why I gave you that book? Because... I'll get it for you. Please, could you? <laughs> because this book tells us what our friendship means. It says, the, the book's name is, of course... Pakistan. Uh, I am in Pakistan. It says, Pakistan, I am in Pakistan. I like how repetitive it is. It is repetitive. It yeah. makes sure yeah. that you know where you are. Well, that's this what is, I... You ain't, this is not Kansas anymore, Toto. No. <laughs> it's not. But this is what I've learned from you is always to say something, the same word at the beginning of a sentence and at the end of a sentence I learned from you. Um, I think about our friendship and I ask myself, what was the best day that we ever had? And I think it was the time that we... We were going to Monal. We were going to exactly. Monal. Exactly, we were going to Monal, and on the way, we got hit by... The cyclist. The cyclist. Why did you bring that up? I know. <laughs> Why did you bring that up? I mean... It was, it was terrible, and we buried him <laughs> while he was still... People don't know about this. They don't know that we buried him. He was still him. breathing, and it was in his last breath, he was saying... <laughs> Why did you do this? He asked us. He was really proper, and he just wanted to inquire why would we run him over with the car. But you, you were the one who answered him. You were the one who said, "We were. We did this unintentional. We did this unintentional. We did this unintentional. Unintentional. The UN was United Nations, of course, mm -hmm. and the tensional part was just in addition to make sure that we." 
don't include the UN in this. This is, makes an international matter. It's an international matter because I am a visitor. I am a visitor. I'm a Pakistan. I'm in Pakistan. That's the name of the That's book. That's why I gave you the books so you understand that in Pakistan, you can't just run over people and expect <laughs> them to stay quiet. Yeah, you, they're going to talk. People are going to talk. And the whole secret's going to be out in one day or the other. Well, you buried him and already you're telling everybody about it. You know, I called my lawyer. I did. You did? You what? I called my lawyer. You called your lawyer? He, he said to me, we will sort this issue. It is not a problem. <laughs> we will sort this issue. It is not a problem. He is a great lawyer. He's a he great is lawyer. So incredible. I mean, you literally sort it out. I go, oh, whatever. Just another cyclist, huh? Wow. If, if, it's, if he's available, I have a list of other un unsolved murders that he can help you with. Why not? I mean, apparently it's okay. You it's, know? Yeah. it's perfectly yeah, fine. Yeah. But listen, Jim, on today, today's a special day for me. Mm -hmm. And I want to give you a gift for that. Oh, oh another I gift. Had, I just had to. You know, whenever I get a gift, I start to... Smile first. Smile first. <laughs> you smile I... first, but you're going to cry later, because here's your gift. <laughs> for you. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. I knew this would make you cry. You know what he looks like, or who he looks like? He looks like... A 10-year-old. A 10-year-old. <laughs> Yay, thank you, thank you so much. Let's have a round of applause for our volunteers. Thank you, you did a wonderful job. Thank you. I get that. I get that. So the other thing is, how disturbing. You know, we, we, <laughs> we're driving, we run over a cyclist. My, my lawyer says, that's fine. And then on our 13th anniversary of our friendship, you give me a child who holds in my arms who looks like he's 10 years old. You could not have written that. Why would you have written that? <laughs> so let's very quickly just talk about that. Is that okay? Um, anything you want to say first before we? Uh, I just want to say that the whole th this process, the reason why it works, is because we have when we're communicating, we're not thinking of anything else but the moment. At this moment. I'm not thinking what's going to happen five minutes into the future, or ten minutes into the future, or a year into the future. Because, can I just go ramble on about Please. this? Please. So if we have our mental faculties, yeah? God has given us huge mental powers. And imagine if we can count that into units, 40% of our minds are usually thinking about things that are not present. They're in the future. Things that might happen. We're considering them. We're planning for them. 40% of our mental faculties is in the past. Oh my God, what have I done? What did I do two years ago? Why, I, did, I, why, why did this scene not work? Why, would I, why did I take this choice and not the other? And so we're left with about 20% to use in the moment. Improvisation brings all those faculties together. And that is why this process works. And that is why this works with mental health. Could, you want to expand on that? Yeah, sure. Uh, Bringing all these mental faculties together and being in the present and being in the moment means that you have all your senses, all your intelligence, all the vocabularies, all everything that you've learned so far right in front of you to pick and choose from. And this is not just, this does not happen, uh, this is not just workable for theater. If you can adopt a positive mindset, an improvisational, improvisational mindset, this will really change your lives completely. You learn how to think positively at everything. If you just imagine, if you have rid yourself from the past and the present, then you have rid yourself from all the judgments and all the biases that you see before you can start communicating. If this fine man, this, what's your name, sir? Milad. Milad? If I don't like Milad's face, do you think I'll have a good time communicating with him? No. There'll be some, there'll be some obstacles in free, freely communicating with him, right? What if all of us, or at least in this space, this safe space that, that we have created here, there's no judgment. There's no biases. And when you're listening to someone, you give your absolute complete attention to the other person, because otherwise this process just won't work. If I'm not listening to exactly what he said, or there are people who are, or our audience members who are here helping us, if we don't understand, if we don't listen properly, listen actively, none of this can work. So imagine if at your homes, at your offices, your families, with your bosses, with your coworkers, when they're speaking to you, when they're talking to you, are we really listening to them? Or 
before they finish their question, half of the answer is already in our heads. We know that this person is going to say that we already have the responses ready for that question, right? I feel, and I think maybe uh, my uh, co-panelists can, can expand on that, that just by giving absolute pure attention to someone, that is a huge, that's the biggest gift that you can give to them, I feel. I agree. I want to say one other quick thing, and then we'll do another demonstration, but that makes total sense. The other thing, too, is through improvisation, we train our body to get used to that fight or flight response. How many of you, while you were watching this, were thinking, oh my gosh, I'm so glad I'm not sitting up there? You can raise your hand if you would. Yeah, thank you, sir. Yeah, yeah. But when, when most people get in a situation which is uncomfortable or ambiguous, I have, our fight or flight response happens, right? And we become very afraid, we become very tense. What happens to your body? I'll ask this of the, of the audience here. What happens to your body when you're in that fight or flight response? How does it, how does it heart react? Rate goes up. Your heart rate goes up. Adrenaline rush. Yeah, you get this adrenaline rush, exactly. What happens to your face? Your muscles stiffen. Your, your muscles stiffen, your face freezes, you take shallow breaths, you do all these things that interfere with your ability to think beyond the, the threat. And for many of us, when we get up in front of a group of people, particularly if we're dealing with some sort of anxiety, our bodies will tell us that we're under fire, that we are, we are under threat. Improvisation helps us get around that by having us just focus on saying yes to the moment. And when we keep focusing on the other person and on the moment, our body begins to interpret that response differently. And so suddenly we have energy rather than fear. And it's a practice that we can do over and over again that has actually worked really well with people who are struggling with that kind of anxiety. Um, I'm gonna try something else now. And if, Fizza, would you mind uh, coming up here and joining us? Thank you. <laughs> and uh, do you wanna have, a, if you would both have a seat, that would be great. Do you wanna, does this, oh, I don't know what to do with this. I right. have a mic. All right. So, with improvisation, another thing that we do that helps us deal with whatever anxiety we might have or any kind of feeling we have in our body is we see everything as a gift. Whatever comes our way, we accept it. And by practicing that acceptance, the things that are normally threatening, ah, they're not so much anymore. So we are in really good luck because sitting next to me are two experts on a really esoteric topic, something that most of us know nothing about. So, coming to you for inspiration, what is a topic that Fiza and Kasim probably in real life don't have a lot of expertise, but as improvisers, they have tremendous expertise? What is a topic that you would want to hear about? Quantum physics. Quantum physics. Okay, quantum physics. I know you're both physicists, so okay, <laughs> that's great. Quantum <laughs> physics. And what's going to happen is they are going to be experts on quantum physics, a situation that would send most of us into a sense of panic because, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> But they're improvisers, and they're going to practice saying yes, being non-judgmental, and receiving gifts. Okay? So here they are. They're, they're quantum physicists. This is a, a show called More Than You Need to Know. I'll be the moderator. But let's meet our quantum physicists or people who are experts on it, and uh, then we'll come to them for questions. So uh, actually, ma'am, would you mind going first, uh, but with an introduction? Uh, you'd like to know about me? I would love to know I'm about you. I'm surprised that people don't already know everything that they need to know about me. I mean, if you've come to this seminar, then you should know who I am. Is that not so? I am, uh, well, um, with due respect to my uh, co-expert here, um, I am the biggest name in quantum physics in the civilized world. Of course, I am not counting those little places in the middle of the jungles that are not civilized and know nothing about physics whatsoever. Um, I have only been working in this field for about 72 years now. Um, since the age of three, I have been dabbling in quantum physics and I have come up with lots of, lots of new theories. And of course, I have under my belt the Nobel Prize, of course, for physics as well as, well, various other prizes. If you'd like, you can read the little booklet you got when you walked in, you know, it lists everything. So yes, I think that I don't really need to go on and on. It's, uh, <clears throat> I believe I'm, I'm known to all of you. Can I bring something up because I'm, I'm one yes, of your yes. protégés. And um, <laughs> as a student of yours, I know that, that, that you were very insistent that we refer to you in a particular way in your presence. Um, can you tell us what name we can use for you that is not going to set you off? Yes. Um, 
Professor Dr. Quantifo. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Dr. Quantifo. Yes, I still have all of my notes. And the fact that you asked us to write that at yes, the top please. of every page, yes. yes Professor please. Dr. Quantifo. Thank you so much. Let's have a round of applause for our, 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 our most esteemed guest. And joining you today is... Hmm. <laughs> is it my turn already? Oh, yes, please. Yeah. <laughs> my name is uh, Dr. Francois Quantifo. I am a très, uh, très, uh, PhD, mm -hmm. so it's Dr. 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 Mm -hmm. François Patois, mm -hmm. and uh, I am the leader in uh, quantum physics. Mm -hmm. uh, I uh, was the only one uh, doctor who uh, made the CERN uh, uh, quantum uh, research lab, and I was the first one who uh, discovered that uh, the atom, you know atom? I, I do know the you atom. Know yes. atom. You know atom? Atom, small particle, smallest particle, you can break it into multiple pieces and uh, it will uh, give you a lot of energy and you can actually eat the atom for your energy and I make connection between quantum physics and uh, uh, dietary uh, nutrition. My dissertation, my, uh, my dissertation is about uh, the pizza atom, especially with the ketchup. <laughs> exactly, and, and again, phenomenal. So, uh, well, yes, but it, it's small. It's small. Three PhDs, three PhDs, three PhDs, three PhDs, three PhDs, three PhDs, one Nobel Prize, three PhDs. He has managed to break up an atom and turn it is all It is all political, Nobel Prize is all evil. political, it was made by a guy oh, who make oh, oh. Can dynamite. Can I word in here? No. Uh, Try PhDs. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm the one who made why would you bring her? Now, you'll why would you bring her into this panel? Still, I don't understand. When why, had, why, why? We've had this panel before. We've had to bring in the UN to actually moderate. So, um, I, 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 I just had a call. They're saying that uh, Uranus is about to explode. <laughs> <laughs> we'll yeah, we'll talk about it. Yeah. So, yes, yeah, I was so the main consultant on that too, on that project, uh, the, the destroy the universe. Well, let's and let's, the, let's and use that as a um, as need. A, need I say again? <laughs> Let's use this as a question right. then. Um, <coughs> Uranus is absolutely useless, so we can allow it to blow up, right? What I have managed to do is to make the, the sun go around the earth, as ancient man used to think was the case, right? Uranus is, is the most useless is, is, of the earth going around the sun. I proved that we could, we could reverse that. He's talking about energy pills, I mean, really. Let's start with a question. <laughs> Good, this is great. We've learned quite a bit already. So I'll ask you first question and then think about what you want to know because here's an opportunity to ask anything you want. You brought one up about exploding Uranus. Thank you so much for that. All right, good. So I know that both of you have been held up in, in high esteem as scientists. And having been a student of yours and a fan of your work, and also I have been, I've bought the, the cereal that you have since packaged and it's made me feeling a lot more active. Um, could you tell us in your own voice how you define science? And um, if we could start with you, please. <clears throat> science. Um, well, how do we define science? Science is really um, the, way that we, the way that we think, you know, the way that we feel, the way we are, who we are. That is really science. You know, we talk about the science of everything. It's about the, the functioning of things. It's about how things work. It's about how, how the brain works for some people, of course, not for everybody. Um, but yes, so science basically is something that we breathe, we live, we eat, we, we talk, we feel all the time. I think that is the best definition we can come up with for the word science. I have that in my notes at home. Right. I, I've written that whole thing out. That's so good. Sir, how about for you? After this? Yeah. Science, my friends, is love. Science is affection. Science is amour. Science it lives and thrives inside all of us. You are science. I am science. Everything is science, except from her. <laughs> he has just repeated what I said in a different way, and he's taking credit for it. And here we have fission. Nice, good. Um, so what do you want to know about quantum physics? Please, here's your chance. Raise your hand, ask a question, I'll repeat it, and we'll, we'll get the answer. Sir. What's the name of the biggest 
black hole ever known to mankind. <laughs> what is the name of the biggest black hole ever known to mankind? Is there a, uh, one Sir, of the... Sir, you are sitting in it. <laughs> <laughs> what a question. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much. Another question, please. Uh, sir. Would you please define what physics is? Ah, well, could you please define what physics is? We've talked yes, about Why science. don't you define what is physics? Why don't you, sir? <laughs> well, Fine, I will. Uh, I with this, uh, of course, I would love to talk about ours on uh, physics. Physics is all about physical things. Physique. <laughs> Physical exercise, physical allure, attraction, physics. Physics is chemistry. <laughs> physics is biology. Physics. physics is physical chemistry and biology. Actually, I, I, uh, <laughs> I like that. Uh, yeah. I like that physics and chemistry, yeah? Coming okay, together. great, good. Uh, we have you another good. question, please. Somebody, yes, sir. I want to know which one of you can debunk the flat earth theory. Uh, which one of you can debunk the flat earth theory? Are you theory? saying that the earth is not flat? <laughs> How dare you? Yesterday I had a friend who fell off the end of it. Yes. How can you say the earth is not the flat? The earth sir? is not flat. Are you, are you crazy? Are you out of your mind? How can you say this in front of such noted physicists and chemists and quantum theorists? So just to be clear, the Earth, in fact, is flat. Oh, of course. Absolutely. I'm so sacre bleu. How you even oh, say this? This is this oh. city absurd. Oh. oh, my goodness. Well, we've learned quite a bit. Another question, please. Something that you've always wanted to know. We have this side of the audience, too. We have, you've helped us out. Sir? Yes, sir. Uh, could you please tell me what is the age of this universe? What is the age of this universe? Excellent question. <coughs> <clears throat> well, whatever Simpered. the age of the universe, it is old enough to make me very, very young. <laughs> <laughs> is it not so? I totally agree. <laughs> <laughs> we have time for one more question. Things are heating up a bit. Yes, sir. It's in the news for quite some time that the Earth is, might be slipping out of the orbit uh, and it might just slip into the universe out of the solar system. What can the quantum physics do, uh, physicists do to bring it back into the orbit? What can, I mean, I just can, what can you do? The, the, we're here that the, the Earth is slipping out of its orbit. Yes. Yeah, it's like a flat pizza that's going off into the... Yeah, frisbee. Into, yeah frisbee, exactly. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, so what can you physicists do, other than observe, how can you actually change the course? You did change the fact that we yes. go around the sun now. <clears throat> that is true. Or the sun goes around us. Uh, but you need to also ask yourself, do we want it to be back in this orbit? I mean, look at all the, how would I say it, the toxicity of this universe. I mean, imagine if we allowed the world to slip into another orbit, imagine the new universes we could find and perhaps there would be something better than this one, would you not say? I, for one, completely agree. Right. Absolutely. I think you and I are beginning to see eye to eye about I many think things. if we can, uh, if uh, you apply your research page paper on uh, uh, attaching a rope to mm -hmm. the earth and pulling it slightly, mm -hmm. yeah, pulling all the work, maybe mm -hmm. they can, uh, we can bring you the earth what? a bit closer. I got the idea from a balloon. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause oh, for genius. our two esteemed guests. I'll say a few things. <laughs> Again, so much we've learned so much, so much. Um, let me ask this question: What did you see uh, Fizza and Kasim doing up here that that made this work? This was a wonderful scene. It was very funny. Humor, humor. The excellent humor, absolutely. Anything else you noticed? Yes. I, mean, I oh. think the kind of relationship they created, the hatred in the beginning, uh, the, the hatred or disliking for in the beginning, and which then turned into a liking and kind of a relationship, uh, relationship started building. In. Right. Yeah. So you know, the opposite of, of love is indifference. They clearly had a very strong bond that was evolving right in front of us. Yeah. That was great. What else? Aiming yeah. arrows heavily. I'm sorry? Aiming arrows heavily in the sky. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Aiming arrows out high, high in the sky. <laughs> say, say more. Tell, tell me more what you mean. Uh, the way they improvised and 
added new flavor. Yes. So they said and. They kept adding things to what was going on. They had a really strong relationship. They had questionable physical theories, although you might be right for all I know. I was an English major. Um, yeah, I, I never know. did physics. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. But they, yeah, they kept on, we, we call it exploring and heightening. They kept going higher and higher, which worked really well. Sir, you had your... So the unprepared answers and those spontaneous replies that we got mm -hmm. was very new for us, and that is, this is what made it humorous for us. Right, it was unexpected, and you know the source of comedy is always a surprise, and so we yeah, we didn't expect any of this. This was this was wonderful, sir. Uh, so you guys uh, know each other since long since a long time, right? I'm assuming. Not that long, actually, no. What if uh, what if two improvisers are in a situation where they completely don't know each other and the topic is just like this completely no random? Uh, me and him, we've met two days, two days ago. ago. Never worked before. But the language of But the language of improv is universal. Uh, when I've done shows internationally, I've worked with Indians, I've worked with people from the UK, people from the US, and... Uh, just by hanging on to the to the basic principles of listening, of agreeing, of accepting gifts, of uh, canceling out judgments or delaying judgments, and just committing to the scene as it is and being in the moment, it doesn't matter where you're from, it doesn't matter who you are. As long as we're working around these principles, we can make anything possible. That's that's how I feel. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Good, right. Good. <clears throat> I love that question, too, because that also gets at the root of a lot of people's uh, anxiety and struggles with mental illness. When something is un unclear to us, you all know this, we tend to have either a response where we move away from it or we defend ourselves. And we need to do that sometimes. But if we do it too often, it cuts us off from other people and it cuts us off from life and it cuts us off from the, the choices that we can make that will make our lives happier and healthier. And so the thing I love about improvisation is that it trains us, if we, if we practice it, it trains us to see every single person as an opportunity, as a, as a gift, but also this is the first time. If we were to do another scene right now with a different uh, su suggestion, a different relationship, it would be completely different yeah. because Fizza and Kasim are both really good improvisers who know that if you come in with a plan, if you come in with preconceptions, it's gonna get in your way and it's gonna bring up all of that old information which can be useful in certain circumstances, but when we're talking about anxiety, it's not helpful at all. So. Is it right to say that every good actor is a good improviser? Uh, I'm going to let Fizza answer that because... Uh, is every good actor an improviser? That would depend on how you define a good actor. right? I think that for anybody to be a good actor, again, it's very... Th this phrase that Jim's, Jim keeps using, being in the moment, is hugely, hugely important also for an actor. And every actor to some extent needs to be an <coughs> improviser. Because on a stage is, yes, you are prepared, right? You have a script, <clears throat> you have learned your lines, you know where you're supposed to be sitting, you know what you're supposed to be doing, you know what somebody is going to say next, you know what you are going to answer, right? And yet you don't. Why don't you? because you are dealing with a situation that is evolving in the moment. And the lines may be the same, but today Jim just might have said them a little bit differently. And when Jim has said them differently, it means I will respond differently. Because if I respond in the same way as I have rehearsed and I have practiced, then we're not telling an honest story, <clears throat> right? Then it's not the truth anymore. Because if I am in the moment, I will respond to whatever Jim has just thrown at me, right? So the lines, the words may be exactly the same, but the situation is perhaps not the same. So you can perform the same play 180 times, and 100, 180 times you will see a different play, right? Um, also, again, you need to be prepared. As an actor, you need to be prepared for anything that might happen on that stage. And things go wrong. Things go wrong all the time. Right? I don't think there is ever, and my fellow uh, actors will agree with me, I don't think there is ever a production, ever a performance that goes exactly as planned. <clears throat> it never does. And there is always somebody on that stage who has to improvise. So the more you rehearse being in the moment, the more you are, you are present, the more you are actively listening to the other people on that stage, the better the actor you are. And as an actor, you have to constantly 
actively listen. You cannot just reel your lines off, because if you do that, once again, you are just, you're like the parrot repeating the lines. You are not telling an honest story. Again, I will, you know, I think that sort of, um, does that sort of yeah, answer exactly. your question? I'll also say this, um, as somebody who, be, who began as an improviser, um, and I had never done a scripted play when I became an improviser. The first scripted play that I did, I found utterly baffling. Because here were words that had already been said, already been written, and it, it took a lot for me to figure out how to, how to bring life into them, how to be in the right. moment when it's right. already there. And I do think yeah. one of the reasons I do get hired is I'm not good at memorizing lines. Um, so it's, <laughs> I know, you don't hire me. So, it, yeah. <laughs> so it's a new show every time I step out on stage because inadvertently I end up improvising. Right. And I think that that's the whole idea. You have to take those lines and you have to make them your own in the situation at that given time. If not, they're very dead, right? They've been rehearsed so many times. So for example, uh, I have, uh, Jim has to say to me, oh, that's a knock on the door. And I'm supposed to be frightened. I've heard it 75 times, you know, for me to be frightened, I have to actually be in the moment. I have not heard that knock yet. Right? Until Jim says, oh, that's a knock on the door. Right? So you really, you have to make it new every single time. And I think active listening, which is what an improviser does, is what gives you that ability. And you have to immerse yourself in it. You have to be in the moment. You have not, so you are not anticipating what is to come, even though you know what is to come. Right? Mm -hmm. As an actor, it's very important to not anticipate what I'm going to get next. Because if I do, then uh, I'm very boring. Then you know exactly what's going to happen next. Right. And can, so. I, can I add this into the mental health part? Because I think that's so important. The, the only place that, that I said this earlier that we have power is in the moment. We can't fix the past. We can't do anything with the present. And I know that when I watch good actors and I see them being in the moment, they're powerful. You know, their, their emotions are real. Their, their bodies are reacting as if it were the first time but that's because they aren't anticipating. They're not, they're not beating themselves up for what I would have done. I'd look at you and say, someone's outside, but there wouldn't be a knock on the door, and the whole cast would have to evolve around the fact that I didn't mention the door knock that was right. the most important part of the play, and you know, it's probably <laughs> called the knocking door, and I, I just said, someone's here. Oh, but I make my fellow actors work, so that's good. Okay, Jim, if we are in the, that specific moment and trying to respond to the other person, is it on? Uh, so how come uh, this uh, joke aspect or humor aspect come to your mind always? Why does it? Why does improvisation turn into a joke? You mean? Yeah. Is that most of the time. Most of the time, uh, because like and I said, that doesn't apply in the real life. No, it doesn't. And and one of the things that I want to be really clear about is going through life with an improvisational mindset does not mean constantly trying to get a laugh. It doesn't mean that everything is funny, and it's not, of course, by any stretch. The the thing that I think is so important about improvisation is it's based on this notion of yes and. You, you acknowledge what's happening, but you also acknowledge the things that are tragic or the things that are melancholy or the things that are difficult. Every, before every single show, we get together and we very briefly check in and a lot of us will acknowledge the fact that we're maybe having nerves or that we don't want to be there tonight because we'd rather be home doing our laundry. We, we acknowledge the reality of the situation and we always start from that. And once we acknowledge what's actually happening you know, within us or around us, um, then we are in the moment and we can proceed from that point. Does that make sense? That okay. And uh, Jim, have you ever tried this improvisation with your wife? With my wife? Um, I've tried it with friends. In fact, I imp well, we don't have a script at home. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But, but I'll, I'll, I think I'll try to answer your question. Um, I know that when I'm, when I'm really in an improvisational mindset, and I'm having conflict at home, you know, when something just isn't going right, the best thing that I can do is acknowledge the conflict. If I pretend the conflict isn't happening, then that, that makes everybody angry, and it doesn't get to the heart of the problem. And, you know, you, you don't want to have deep discussions every single time there aren't enough, there's not enough cereal left, even if it's made out of I atomic know. matter, yeah. <clears throat> but by being present to somebody, by really being present and acknowledging what they say, not only by you know, listening, but by looking at them and, you know, leaning forward and doing all those things that good actors do, you're, you're telling the person, I value you. I don't agree with you necessarily, and it's clearly your fault, but, you know, I value you, 
And that, that tends to make relationships much, much stronger. I'll say something that I said today very quickly. Um, I tend to go on and on. But I taught developmental psychology for years. And we would often talk about how from the moment we're born, we look to our, our parents' faces. And if you look at a, an infant, even if within the first hour of life, and you present a blank face, if you don't give anything back, if you don't start to mirror them the way that we do with babies, where we go, Louie. If we, don't, if we do that, it takes two or three seconds for the baby to panic. And we never lose that. I know, will you hold the baby? Thank you so much. Um, and I do think that's also true in relationships and it's true in improvisation. We know when someone's not listening to us. We know when someone is, is cut off. We know when they'd rather be someplace else. We know all of that. We might not think it, but our body tells us that and we go into that kind of panic. Um, and so I do think improvisation has helped me at home by being just more present and, and really showing that I'm listening. And when I'm not, because a lot of times I don't, um, I can be held accountable. I, I'm curious what, what you think about this. Does this... Oh, we were looking off the screen. I felt like you weren't listening. So <laughs> but does that make sense? You know, that, Absolutely. Yeah, so. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> uh, any married people here? Lots of them. Okay. Uh, no? Right. So whoever like I'd like to ask um, gentleman back there. Sir, could you? Uh Bakar. Uh, Bakar bhai, when you got married, did you plan for the for your wedding? You must have made some plans for your wedding, or your wife must have made some plans for the wedding. <coughs> like plans or having dreams. <laughs> Dreams or plans, <laughs> things that you want to... Yeah, both of them. Both of them, right? For how long? <coughs> Must be years of planning that, that went into the Shadi and the Parad and the Valima and the Mehendi and everything. Yep. Yes? A lot of planning. Perfect. Did the wedding go as you planned? Exactly as you planned? Time uh, flew really fast. No, the, the event itself. The event, uh, you know, the kind of things that I planned... Yeah, exactly not like that happened. Yet, um, it flew really fast. I mean, I wanted the event to go for a longer period of days. I'm sure you time. did. I'm <laughs> sure you did. They enjoyed it more. Uh, the point I'm trying to make is, when I, when I ask this question to ladies who have, who really put in a lot to the planning of their wedding, and I ask them, how much, what percentage of the wedding went exactly as you planned for years and years and years? One of my exes, I'll just, share a story she had even written the wo jo tappe hote hain likhe hue the usne pehle se ki maine shaadi pe ye gaane 10 10 saal pehle se and i asked her what did what did go as per plan she said hell no nothing happened everything was going hey we had no idea the point i'm trying to make is that life is not planned life we live we life is improvised we're always improvising each and every one of us when we leave for work we're improvising we nothing happens exactly like we plan it to you know? So developing a positive mental mindset, what it would do is it would, it would make uh, everything that we do come into a positive light. Small things that detract us. Actually, coming just springboarding from what, uh, what Fiza said, uh, when an artist, uh, think of what she said as a microcosm for the whole life. In the macrocosm, if you start with a judgment, if you start with pre-planned notions, if you start with some inhibitions, definitely in, in the communication and in the logistics and operation of your life, there will be challenges, right? But what if, and this, it, this question comes up a lot when we're doing corporate workshops and dealing with not, not students, but actual people who, who, have, who are running the daily lives. How can we not judge? If, some, if a boss tells you to do something, how can we not judge if you're given a file to or having a discussion and someone presents a point, how can we not judge? Because judgment is a part of the human process. So the response is that yes, we, there might be situations when you need to judge, but you just delay that judgment. You keep the moment judgment free. You keep the moment bias free. So you, when your moment is clean, like Jim said, all the power is within your hands. And that is where, that is where you can make the most of that particular moment. And what the improvisational mindset teaches you is to cherish 
each moment with all that it is, whether it's good, whether it's bad, the best you can make out of that particular moment, not just on theater, not just on stage, but in life, uh, it is the most beautiful thing you can do. Basically, live it. Living your life every one moment at a time. <laughs> I think it's human nature to plan as well. It's not that we can't plan, but I think what it's important to do is to, to be open to the fact that plans may not work out as we thought, and that there might be new surprises along the way, and some of them will be fantastic ones and some won't, but that's just how it is. I think that, we, that the idea is to not become fixated on those plans, um, to have them as a sort of guiding mm -hmm. sort of principle. We're moving in that direction. But you know, maybe if there's another road somewhere, we just might want to take it and that will be all right as well. Um, so it's, I think the problems arise when we become so fixated on future plans that we forget that there is a today and there is a now. Um, and that the now is eventually what is going to determine the tomorrow. And if we forget to live the today, then where is the tomorrow supposed to come from in any case? You know, so, um, so if we take our mind as, as a network of roads, hmm? and if we keep using the same road to get to where we want to every time, yeah. there are so many roads, yeah. there are so many other, other paths that we can take, but by using the same road again and again, we kind of forget everything else that's out there. So when... It's reassuring, it, right, it's reassuring, to take the yeah. same road. Really you safe. know it's going to take you... It's secure. Where, yeah. But is that, is that how life should be, just all safe and sound? So when we use ambiguity as a tool, or when we, we, when we interact with integrity, ambiguity in a positive manner, what's happening is that we're trying to explore those unexplored roads in our, in our head, those paths that we generally don't take. For ex and you know, our, our brain will tell us that, no, 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 don't go on this road because this is not safe. If I tell you that this color is blue, everybody's mind say, no, no, this is not blue, this is red. But what if I just accept this as blue? That would, what, what's going what's to happen? It's just going to add a new possibility. It's going to give me a new opportunity to explore this wall as something else. Like we just demonstrated in front of you. So imagine if you could do that with everything in your life. Everything can springboard into a million possibilities. And the more possibilities you have, the the more expanded you are. And for expansion, you need to have acceptance. Like we said, the, the concept of yes and, like Jim said, is about acceptance and expansion. Acceptance of yourself first. If you accept yourself first, if you stop judging yourself first, only then you can stop judging other people or other things. Yeah. And I can uh, link it with hiking. I go for hiking on Mother Hills. Whenever I'm going to fixed trails, like Trail 3 or Trail 5, so there is no much fun, no much uh, curiosity, no unseen things. But whenever I take some uh, trail which is unnamed, which may have some uh, wild plants, which may have some difficulty in it, later on I really enjoy it, recalling that trail, right. forgotten, uh, just out of that moment to take a different path. That's how I link it. It must be really empowering. It must be. Uh, yeah. Must be really but proud of. Giving new, uh, new visions, new horizons, new views, new scenic yeah. beauty. All these things one can explore. I can link it with that too. Thank you. See, I can't stop thinking about fights at home. Thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> um, but one of the things about improvisation, I'll say this quickly, is that we we see it as an infinite game. 
we played games today at our workshop and we gave the, the participants just a few rules, things like say yes, be present, simple things like that. And the games evolved and changed and they were, they were really remarkable. They were funny and disturbing and strange and all of that. Um, improvisation encourages us to play an infinite game rather than a, a finite game. And a finite game, they're great. Uh, apparently cricket is a finite game. I don't understand it. It seems to go on forever. But there is a beginning and an end and somebody wins and there are spectators and there are players. And those are great. But if you're in a relationship and you're playing a finite game, then you want to win every conversation and you want to win every argument and you want to determine what happens. And that's not a, that's not a relationship. That's, you know, something else entirely. It's a power play. It is a power play. Improvisation by its very nature is not a power play. It's always collaborative and with an infinite game, the goal is to keep the game going as long as you can. And so to be in a successful marriage or close relationship, you have to be, you have to have boundaries, but you also have to be porous and you have to be curious and you have to keep inviting new information in and being willing to be a participant and be a spectator and regardless of what the, or particularly what the moment requires. And I do think training in improvisation takes us out of that power situation a lot of the time. You, you mentioned it as being very humbling. Yeah. We're just participating, which is really the best we can do. If we operate in a group, where we have a improvisational mindset, there is no star there. There is no star. Everybody is equal and everybody is trying to make the other person look good. You understand that every person is like this, that the other person is like this. जब मैं बॉल कराऊंगा तो मैं अगले मैं ऐसी बॉल कराऊंगा अगले बंदे की टका के चक्का मारे जो अगले की स्ट्रेंथ्स हैं उनको फुली प्रेजेंट करूंगा मैं एंड व्हेन दिस गोस अराउंड इन अ सर्कल एवरीबॉडी लुक्स गुड इट्स अबाउट व्हाट वी क्रिएट टुगेदर इट्स नॉट अबाउट एनी वन पर्सन या सो दैट्स व्हाई आई आई लाइक आई मेंशन हिम इट्स अ वेरी हमलिंग एक्सपीरियंस इट्स यू इट इट मेक्स यू हमबल इट मेक्स यू अ गुड पर्सन इट मेक्स यू अ पॉजिटिव पर्सन व्हेन वी आर प्रैक्टिसिंग व्हेन वी आर इन दैट सेफ स्पेस ऑफ इंप्रोवाइजेशन आई आई मीन बिलीव मी द वर्ल्ड लुक्स सो ब्यूटीफुल Everybody looks so beautiful. I just, everybody looks lovely. Everybody, you just see the positive in everything, and that I think where where the groundwork of uh, having a positive mindset and improvisational mindset. Is. I think you lose yourself really yes. in the sense that you cease to you get, exist. You get you get out of out of your anymore. you get yourself out you of get your own way. out of your own head. Yeah, um, it's not about you anymore. You know, it's just about being in the moment again. You know, yeah. we keep coming back to that. But you lose your self-consciousness, you lose everything that you've carried with you up to that particular point, you lose everything. All you want to do is to respond to what is being given to you. It's a give and take. You take, you give back, you take, you give back. And that's, you know, it just, it gets the ball rolling and you keep it rolling as long as you possibly can. Right. And again, I would like to emphasize that this is just, is not just related to theater. This is something that I, everyone, uh, I'm sure we all would agree on this, that everyone must take at least one improv class somewhere, not with us, but anywhere. Just just but go there once. Preferably with us. Well, um, yes. Preferably. <laughs> preferably. And also because there's not much happening, I don't think many people will be doing this. But just just go to a class, and it'll believe me, it has the potential of changing your lives and make and bringing the best of you outside for everyone to see. And you'll have fun. Oh, you'll have fun. Yeah, that's for sure. Um, we do want to announce our show on Saturday, don't we? Um, if people want to in be case, part of something. Yeah, sure. <laughs> we will be. Uh, Jim is so kind and so. It is really a pleasure and honor to have him in Pakistan. Again. Could you please give him a round of applause, guys? Come Again. on. Please sir, come all the way from the show. And, and while he's here, we'll be doing a series of workshops and events and shows uh, in Lahore, Karachi, and Islamabad. The Islamabad show is this Saturday at 6.30, at 6 p.m. at uh, Bani Gala at the Forum with, with Theater Wale. We're all most welcome to please attend and uh, see this happening. Uh, we'll have a young improv team uh, who are going to be doing this. Our show in uh, Lahore is in Olampolo on the 28th. And it's in Karachi. We're performing at the PACC on the 4th of November. Uh, Jim will be there. We'll have a nice little improv group. So I'm sure you'll be able to see firsthand not just the demonstration, but the full force of improvisation coming into power. Uh, I have a question. <laughs> all right, so I have a question that um, is all of this like connected to the statement where they say that we can't change what happens to us, but we 
you can change how we react to it. I'll say something to quickly. To some extent. Yeah, I'd like to hear. To, I think it's true to some extent. I mean, I think we, we do have a lot of power in our lives. I think where we trip up, where I certainly trip up, is when I feel like I have power over other people. So I can determine to a degree what my life is going to be like, given the, the privileges that I have and the family that I come from and all those different parameters. But I can determine that to a degree. But the place where people struggle, I think all of us struggle, particularly for dealing with, with mental illness, is when things don't go the way that we expect. Um, we have a very difficult time handling that. The ambiguity becomes threat. And so improvisation teaches us how to deal with what comes our way, whether it's good, whether it's bad. We allow that to happen. And I'll say this. We talked about this today. Um, I've done, I can't even think of how many improv shows, probably several hundred. And if I were to use a batting average, a baseball thing, I, my batting average is probably like, a, it's pretty good. It's like a four, you know, 475 or something. I am a decent enough improviser. But I've done a lot of bad improv shows. Yay. Um, <laughs> but the thing that improv teaches me is that if an if a improv show doesn't go well or if I'm having an off night, um, I can't control that necessarily, but I can control how I react to it and I let it go. I recognize what happened, I, I acknowledge it, and I let it go. And it doesn't become part of the constant story in my head that says, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this. So yeah, to a degree we have a, we can control ourselves, but we also have more control over how we respond. Uh, Jim, I have a question. Now, uh, as you understand that, I'm sure you understand it much, much better than I ever do, uh, Pakistan is not really doing well on the mental health scale in the world. Uh, I think we have the sixth most reported mental health cases in the world. We have um, maybe a, a, a mental health physician for, I think, about 50,000 people, Whoa. which is really low. Um, do you th how would you connect improv and these, the, these mental illnesses or mental conditions, something like anxiety, which is rampant. Every, almost everybody has some sort of anxiety uh, issues. There is depression. There is um, um, ADHD. There's PTSD. How do you think we can use improvisation as a tool to, uh, to, de to deal with these diseases and conditions? Well, I think we're dealing with a, a similar situation. It's different in the States, but there's a lot of stigma around mental illness. You know, if somebody um, says that they are suffering from mental illness, we bring all sorts of stories to that. And there's a lot of stigma around seeking help, particularly psychological help. And the thing I like about improvisation is that you can get some of the benefits of psychological therapy without um, having to you know, actually enter into the... Saying that I'm going to turn a therapist. Right. Without being labeled. Without, Without being, being labeled. labeled. That's, yeah, that's it, the most part. And so I do think that these skills, you can learn them in a, a collaborative, fun, um, open way. I think there's a lot of benefit. Of course, there's tremendous benefit to uh, psychotherapy. Huge benefits. But improvisation is one way to get some of those benefits without having to take on the label of mental illness or take on the label of a therapy mm -hmm. patient. And it's also available, it's, it's, it's much more, it can be much more available than trying to enter into a healthcare system. Mm. We did an a improv workshop today at a university and they're gonna, they were talking about setting up an improv club and that's not gonna take care of all the anxiety and all the, the, the desperate problems that people have, but it's certainly one way for people to begin to address them in a way that isn't threatening. So, um, Look, sir, a question. Uh, in real life situation, sometimes we come across some people who are negative or sometimes say something which is hurting to us or maybe sometimes ignoring us or giving some shut up call kind of things. How improvisation can help us to confront such situation? Interesting question. That's a great question. <laughs> yeah. I'll start by saying some things, but I, the thing about improvisation is, is we accept what actually happens. You know, so if somebody says something hurtful to us or attacking toward us, we don't necessarily act as if it doesn't happen. We acknowledge it. But then we also, and I think this is what is the real power is, we also ex examine it briefly and then we let it go. If it's something that happens constantly and becomes abusive, we have the power to walk away from it, we hope, you know, if we acknowledge it enough. But in day-to-day -day slights and day-to-day -day disagreements, um, we recognize that 
the, the more we hold on to something and create it and make it a story um, that we start to believe, we're limiting our abilities to, de to deal with it in the, the present moment. Does that make sense? And so we, we constantly try to, try to let go of our stories like that. Jim, yeah. isn't this one of the moments where in improv you say no? If, if somebody's hurting you, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. If somebody's hurting you, if someone's being abusive. Silence. Well, you do what you, it depends on the context, but you do what you can to in protect yourself. Life, you're asking, how would you deal with it in real life? But again, it, but it does depend on the context. For example, if somebody, if, you know what, to go back to, you brought up the home front thing. So, um, <laughs> you know, at home, we say hurtful things. Like recently, uh, last week, I was expecting to beat a person on hiking. Mm -hmm. He has been to Nanga Parbat base camp, and he was like rescued from there. So we had uh, planned a meeting on trail on specific time and he said, okay, I'll be there. According to the time commitment, I was there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I called him, I texted him, there was no reply. And I just texted him in the last disappointing. And then I went on to my hike. A couple of hours ahead, I got a voice message that uh, I slept, my plan was changed. Uh, you are disappointed, no problem, we, will, we won't meet again. Oh, wow. Now, what, what should be a response if I try to put this improvisation into real life? Like that, yeah. You just, you I am silent from three days, but I am just giving a situation. Mm -hmm. How would you suggest to respond okay. to such situation in real life? Well, as an, as an improviser, yeah, I wouldn't pretend it didn't improviser. happen, but I would also, like you were saying, I wouldn't necessarily engage again if 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 that's that's a power struggle you know that's what we're talking about that finite game you know we do have the power to recognize whether we want to participate or whether we don't um, and an improviser can can decide not to participate once they've acknowledged the reality of the situation the danger with this that, that kind of stuff in my opinion is that that can then start to like i said start to become a narrative in your head you know, this person always does that. Everybody always does that, which a lot of us who struggle with anxiety, we begin to take one instance and we make it into something more. Um, because the idea is to be in the moment, this one thing happened. I don't know what your, I don't know what your history is with this friend. Uh, that was, in fact, the starting of a meeting for, this, uh, with the reference of another friend. Okay, um, yeah, so this is the first That was going to be the first meeting, in fact. Then I, you have good information person. about that friend, about this potential <laughs> friend. I, I, would... I, I spoke to him once, mm -hmm. but later on this happened, and then I just withdrew my intentions yeah. to meet him again. I think that there makes sense. Okay. Thank I mean, somebody who, um, well, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you, okay. you won't take him on one of those difficult hikes where he'll be in the moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but again, improvisation, it, it's... It is about having a positive mindset, but it's not expecting life to be positive all the time, not by any stretch. Um, it's about being able to be in those painful moments without turning them into more than they really are. You know, we have to live, this is such a cliche, but we have to live through the pain, we have to live through the anxiety, but we don't have to hold on to it. Don't carry it. Yeah, exactly. Is right. he here tonight? Is your friend here tonight? <laughs> it's, also, you... it's also not a reflection of you. That is, a, that is, I think, one of the important things we have to constantly look at. When people are responding to us in certain ways, it's not always a reflection of who we are. It's more about what they are carrying. Um, and I think that if we can let go a little bit about, uh, of um, you know, the, uh, the anxiety we have about how other people see us and what they think about us and... and if we stop thinking about, oh, they must have done that because they don't like me, for example, then I think we'd just be happier people, generally. Uh, I'll just add to that. See, just through the little demonstration that you saw when me and uh, Fiza were being experts, uh, there were so many opportunities for us to get stuck at one particular point and just never move on. But what improv teaches us is you arrive to a moment you enjoy that moment or experience that moment if it's a negative moment and then you let it go and just move on to the next moment. Yeah? yeah? That, is, that is an essential part of improv that you never get stuck because if I'm worried, like I, like I talked to you about, if I'm worried about how my previous line went, I'm not able to concentrate on my next line. And similarly, just we can expand this on our whole lives. If I, if I have had a heartbreak, 
yeah, that, that even has passed. Now, it's up to me how long I want to hold on to it. Or I want to extract the wisdom from it and move on. Uh, something really cheesy I'm going to share with you. And from someone who I heard, you'll probably laugh. This fine gentleman called Dr. Phil. He, I know, you, you, nothing good to expect. But, but he said something that made sense to me. He said that people can present you with an opportunity to be angry or to be sad or to be depressed. It is up to us. The power of recognizing that, that opportunity or availing that opportunity lies with us. So the worst anybody can do is to present you with an opportunity to be negative or to be abrasive or to, ang or to be angry. In the end, it's whatever you, how you respond is showing how, who you are. Like Abba said, what the other person is, is doing is just laying bare whatever is inside of him. And if all you have inside of you is positivity, that's going to show out. And you'll always you know, look and feel and be happy. And can I say something really practical too? I think that. that I apologize for quoting Dr. Phil. I'm sorry, but this is something. Yeah, I, we'll talk about that later. Um, <laughs> the other thing about it, improvisation is when we get stuck, uh, we always say, "Go to your where or use your body. Get out of your head." So if if we were doing a scene, and I this happens to me all the time, I don't know what to say. I reach over and I hand you something. I do something because that's going to stimulate a new interaction and it's going to put us both in the moment. You are. I have a box for you. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I, have a, I have a good story about that too, yeah. which is great. Um, but if so, there you were. You, I'm. I don't want to describe your experience, but I'm going to anyway. You were on the hiking trail. This f potential friend proves the lack of potential in that friendship, and. You, you, so then, as an improviser, you do something. You go walking. You find a way to get back in your body and back in the moment so that you don't let that kind of disappointment get yeah, engraved in your head. I went on for my hike. And yeah. I I and I bet you had a better hike for it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Question. Uh, does empathy in Pavlov's improvisation? Empathy? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And vice versa. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Prof makes you more empathy. Yeah. yeah. Can you, why, tell me why you asked the question. What? Because the way, when you are in someone else's shoes, you, <laughs> when you are in someone else's shoes, you are, I think you are able to see their perspective as well. And you can debunk their mindset and you can act accordingly. Yes. Uh, with improvisation, and you said this really well, you take care of, your, you take care of yourself, but it's not about you. And so you're always looking to the other person not to save you, not to, not to take care of the situation, but to participate with you. But to do that, you have to have empathy. You have to be able to look at the person and try to read what signals they're giving you, try to be present for that other person. And I do think that, I do think that really does help empathy. Go back, why did you bring up arguments at home? <laughs> um, but, but improv has helped me look at the people in my household and when I get angry, and I get angry every day, every day, not terribly, but I, I get irritated, when I try to look at them and not drag in all of my resentments and try to think, well, this is, they're behaving this way because they've had a rough day. <laughs> I didn't buy the milk. You know, any number of different things, it, it allows that moment to have its moment, but then to just go away. And so my focus is outward. It's not on all my grievances. My grievances come up every moment. Yeah. But but let them go. So uh, I'm into debating, and we have this thing called we call it the MUN. It's called Models United Nations, and what we do is we basically imitate a United Nations committee, and it goes on for three days. And uh, in a room, uh, every single person represents a particular country, and uh, there's a topic, and there's a panel of uh, you know chairs. So. We uh, debate all three days. We assume the topic, we assume the countries, and we assume the situations, and then we go on and ramble on about it for three days. Do you think that's also a form of, a form of improvisation? And do you think that if someone is experienced with that, they would be a good improviser if someone is good with that? I because think improvisation is something you do all the time. It's, I mean, not necessarily as a debater, not necessarily in a room. Improvisation is, I'm, I'm a teacher. I walk into my classroom every morning and it's improv. I may have a lesson plan prepared, but what meets me is not the reality that I expected, perhaps. I mean, 
everywhere where you are having to think on the spur of the moment and respond and react is improvisational. Um, and isn't that every single moment of our lives? I mean, today you are sitting in front of us. If this, if it was a different kind of audience, we'd have a different conversation. Um, again, it's improvisation. This is not a pre-planned conversation. We may have discussed a few directions in which we wanted to take the conversation, but we cannot predict the question that will come from you, right? So I think that at every moment, and yes, perhaps things like that will prepare you to be um, better at improv because you're having to argue, debate, in, in, again, in the moment. Um, the difference, I think, is that you are, you are giving yourself certain uh, parameters that improvisers do not do. So you are a country, you are a representative, you have a topic that is under discussion that is, that is pretty fixed. I think here what you saw when we did the quantum physics thing is that it can go in any direction whatsoever. There are no, there are no uh, boundaries, right? Um, I think that is, that is the basic difference. But yes, life, will, life is improv. We, we make the best of it at any given moment. We, we don't know how long it's going to be. We don't know what the next half hour will bring. We don't know what's going to happen when we walk out this door. It's very much, you know, we, we act on the spur of the moment, every single moment. Um, so everything, you know, but it's just about being conscious of that. I think what improvisation does is it teaches you to be conscious of that, that moment in a way that we don't know, we don't normally think about it. Right. You know, um, we never think about life as being an improv. From the moment we're born, I think we're taught to, to fix things. We put things into boxes. We define things. We um, whether it's relationships, whether it's careers, whether it's, you know, you name it and we want to stick a label onto it. I think what improvisation does is it tears away those labels and it says, you know, just be. Yeah. And I think that is, it, it's the biggest gift that improv gives you is to, you know, it takes all that weight off of you. And you, you feel so light after a session of improv because you have just let go, you know, and um, it's, it's a freedom that you, that you cannot anticipate, you know, you, you cannot imagine what it's like until you actually do it. Yeah. yeah. I have a question. Is improvisation one of the reasons why children are always happy? Yeah. If yes, does it decrease with age by oh, default? Yes. We teach them to grow out of it, I think, <laughs> yes. Uh, also, it's a choice, I think, that the moment will happen anyway. It's just you enjoy it. Right. The, the life comes to us in moments whether we yeah. like it or not. Can, can I say something uh, quickly about the, the children thing, though? Because yeah. I think that's, that's such a great question. Children, they're brilliant improvisers. Yeah. They're the best improvisers. Best, best. I would argue that children are not always happy. I think they're always present. And so when they get furious, they get furious. And they don't have the super ego and all that business that's going to ruin their lives later on. But they have that ability to be in the moment and to play with it. You watch kids, you've, you've all watched kids play. It's artists, yeah. They, 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 they can artists and very, they, they just make whatever comes there. Exactly. Yep. And they just make whatever. Yeah, they, I don't care if it's they good. They're just happy. Like, yeah. They don't have like any sort of expectations or anything like that, right? Exactly. And, and that's, it's, it's, it's. Yeah, it's pure. Right? I think with adults, the wonderful thing that I love about improvisation, one of the things I love is that it, it, it reawakens that sense of play. It, it allows you to, to be childlike without being childish. You know, you can begin to immerse yourself in the moment. And it's amazing what, what we come up with when we give ourselves that permission. And like you said, it's, it's, you feel light when yeah. you're done with it. It's a freedom. It's a freedom. And it's something that you can bring into any number of circumstances, any number of circumstances. Um, just to add to what Jim said, um, improv reawakens that sense of play in you. Uh, as an example, I'm sure some of you must remember that when before the internet came through and everything got on television, all digital, we didn't have phones and iPads. I, when I was a kid, I could have like a piece of wood and I could play with it for hours upon oh, yeah. hours upon hours, sure. never getting bored. And that's the kind of sense we're trying to, when we, when we uh, do improv, we don't act, we play. 
We call ourselves players. We play games because we want to have that sense of freedom that anything can be anything. A pencil can be a rocket ship. Uh, a, a, a shoe can be a boat. Anything can be anything. We, we, we want to uh, explore every bit of that sense of play. And that is, I think, the most beautiful things that, of improv because it, re, it, it reconnects you to that free to free mindset that you used to have when you were a kid. Yeah. I do. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Only culinary yeah. corner physics. <laughs> I read a lot. I, yes. Yeah. I don't think that is connected to, to improv. What, so, yeah. Can I ask yes, you quickly, what, what were you thinking? Well, 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 Actually, since, since I understood that improvisation has nothing to do with being humorous, it's about making a story. You know, continue with the story and conversation and for hours and hours, two people sitting together, they can talk and talk and listen to each other and, 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 and you know, enjoy that moment of freedom and, you know, freedom of thought and, you know, uh, like, like a diver, a swimmer, you know, no ifs and buts. Uh, naturally, it means that back in your mind, you need to have lots of knowledge, yeah? You need, you, you need to have, uh, you know, so, so for instance, if we are right now gonna be talking about football, I need to know something about football, you know, the team, the players. Sir, we knew players. nothing about yeah. quantum <laughs> physics. We knew nothing so about it's, quantum physics. It's not going to be like that. It's, is it uh, to, I to think make it more meaningful? Yeah. I mean. <laughs> well, can, can I say something very quickly? Very quickly, um, I do think that people who bring a lot to an improv scene, as these two did, um, that is wonderful. That's great. But I'll, I'll, one of the best improv classes I ever had was with adults. They were mostly young adults. They were educated. They had all the privileges, everything. And in our class was a, a man who was a little bit older who had a traumatic brain injury. And so for him, his cognitive scope had really been funneled. I mean, he was, he was you know, almost barely functional. And he'd also lost some vision. He was the best improviser in that class because what he did is no matter what happened, he took that yes and principle to heart. So somebody would look at him and they would, and I'm guilty of this, they'd say something really clever like, I brought you a Macintosh apple to wear with your Macintosh Macintosh. You know, I just judged. I'll let that go. Um, and he, he would say, yes. And it caused everybody to slow down and everybody to listen and everybody to take care of one another. And we did some of the best scenes because some of them were clever, but they were all real. They were absolutely real. And it was, it was brilliant. So I do think, yeah, having a great storehouse of information is really important, but it's, n it's not nearly as important as the ability to just divest yourself of everything and be present. That's what I think. Yeah, I think um, improv has nothing to do with facts, with information, with things being correct or not being correct. It's your ability to let your imagination go. And I think that everybody, everybody who is alive brings with them a storehouse of knowledge. So it's different. What you get from a book is different from what you get from the streets. From what, But everybody has this, this whole world and wealth of experience behind them that they bring with them. Um, and I think that nobody comes empty to an improv. Uh, no. I think, you know, you, you bring, everybody puts out on the table whatever it is that they have brought. And amazing, magical things happen from that, I think. Um, it's, not necessarily about the education we've yeah. got or the books we've read or you know how much we know or mm -hmm. I mean yeah quantum physics <laughs> I wouldn't even be able to start to define it you know so but um, the thing is to, to be able to play with it to just to have you know a little bit of fun with it uh, just a couple of things I want to add to this firstly like like you mentioned uh, how much a reserve of knowledge you need to have uh, f firstly since this is a very collaborative exercise and collaborative uh, environment. So the pressure of coming up with something is, does never lies with just one person alone. I had complete trust in her that she will respond to whatever stupidity I come up with and maybe she had similar trust in me so we had so we so we could come up with something together. The second thing I would like to mention is that whether it's a uh, actor, whether it's an actor or whether just uh, anyone. Like Abba said, we have 
a field of experience, which is our true personalities, all the things that we've seen, we've heard, we've experienced, we bring them all on the table. And also, an actor by, uh, I would say, um, by nature is more observant. You observe people, you look at, you, 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 can, you see characters on stage, you characters off stage, in, in the streets you can meet people who you can take really strongly from. But the key here is that you need to be open to knowledge. Sometimes, uh, like quantum physicists who have really, you know, who have super amounts of knowledge, that knowledge can be a blockage to getting new knowledge. You know what I'm saying? That when, if, some, if I feel that I've acquired all the knowledge in a certain field or just generally, I will, it'll be harder for me to absorb new things. Um, I have this poster in my room that Jim was laughing at. Uh, that's the only poster I have. It says, I know nothing. And the idea behind it is, is that I need, uh, it's, it's so much harder to be a teacher and so much easier to be a student because you're always on the lookout to get more. You're absorbing more. You're, you're never at the point when you feel that, okay, now, I've, now, now I know everything about this field or just generally. So as long as you're open to learning, you're open to absorbing new information, also not just by yourself, but also other people's experiences, other people's visions, their suggestions, their opinions, how they feel towards us or towards yourself or about themselves. As long as you're open to learning, I think you never run out of ideas. And uh, the trust that exists between uh, a safe space of improv, uh, you won't, everybody will be fully supportive and you will never be, a political will never come point when you'll be blank, hopefully. Absolutely. Right? That's a nice way to say it. Mm. Yeah, nice recognize, to accept, and enjoy. That's great. Um, so I had a question. And this question, I think it, 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 it concerns with more often than not every person who's sitting here, or uh, maybe you guys as well. How does an actor deal with desensitization? A customer sales representative who's sitting on his desk or her desk and is dealing with the 100th angry customer who's not getting their signals. Now, for that customer, he's dealing with this issue for the first time in, in, in the last few months. But for that customer sales representative, this is the hundredth person. I am not vibing with that person's energy. For the doctor who's announcing a hundredth death, unfortunately, touch wood, uh, that death is, again, it's a very repetitive uh, thing to happen, unfortunately. But for the person who's undergoing uh, that sort of emotion or that sort of tragedy, there's something that's very common. How does an actor who's sort of uh, practicing with improv deal with desensitization? Because this is something that happens to more often than not everybody. I'll say something quickly, but I'd love to hear Go what ahead. you have to say. Yes. But I know that that's a great question, particularly if you do the same show you were talking about 87 times. And mm -hmm. it's easy to become desensitized to many things in life. In improvisation, what we do is we acknowledge the desensitization first. And I think that most of us are kind of unconscious of it. We, we just feel encumbered and numb. The minute we acknowledge that, that takes the power away from the desensitization and it gives us a chance to make a different choice. But we have to say yes to what's happening in the moment. Not pretend it's not happening or wish it were different, but say, God, I am just worn out. If I say this line one more time, and I never say the line the same way twice because I don't remember it, but if, you know, if I say the same line for the 50th time and I don't have any commitment to it because I'm, I'm desensitized to it and I'm unaware of that, then I'm going to be boring and perfunctory and all that. Right. But if and I recognize that, I have a choice. Yeah. And again, I think it's about taking the, um, how would I, how, the emphasis away from yourself. It's not about you. It's about the other person there. Um, and I think that if you stop thinking about the fact that for you it's the hundredth time you're saying that, and you just listen to the person in front of you and you respond to the person in front of you as is required, I think that takes away that um, desensitization immediately because this is a person in front of you. Um, and they, they have brought something to you and you need to, you need to take it from them, right? And you need to, you need to give something back. Um, I think that pretty much will mean that you are now dealing person to person rather than as somebody who's just reeling off something that has been happening since morning. I think it's again about being there for the other, um, the person who is your partner in that particular moment. Um, it's, it's, about, it's about both of you together. It's not about you, it's not about just them. 
It's about what you're sharing in that moment. Yeah. Uh, can we have one last question? One, one small question. Why no photos? Of? Huh? Why? Why no photos? Why I see the sign. No cell phone. Not so you can, you okay. Can switch off your cell phone. Take, take photos, man. <laughs> we want to be stars. Please take as many photos. I got a haircut like. last week, so <laughs> you know. <laughs> He's really doing it. Right. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah. Um, Kasim, I think it's important before we close for you to tell people if they want to be part of improv workshops, where do they go? What do they do? Who do they contact? Uh, so. We uh, have um, multiple workshops going on uh, no, for, just, for I different don't mean for just different in this week, but you no, know, for different generally. levels yeah. of improv. If you want to start with the if you're a beginner, <laughs> we have uh, a batch that is for people who are ju who just want to interact, want to see uh, what is improv, how it can help them not just through acting but also through, to, to to improve your general lives. We also have advanced courses in which we go for more. Uh, Stricter formats. We do short form comedy. We do some uh, open runs. Then we have the second advanced, the, the advanced level two workshop, which is long form, and we do uh, more complex structures. So please, uh, I, you can contact me anytime. Uh, we have uh, uh, we have practices going on through the week. Uh, can we? I think we have our contact somewhere on the post that was page uh, was created by the black hole. Um, how do I give them my? Uh, maybe I can just write my number. So I just I just put, just put yeah. up my number. Uh, my Instagram uh, is CNC Theater. I'm sure you must have. Uh, Nayar Bhai knows it extremely well. I've been. <laughs> so uh, guys, please, I I would encourage each and every one of you to take at least one class. And like I said, it has changed my life. I've seen so many lives being changed. I've seen people who are epileptic, who are depressive who were suicidal and they have alhamdulillah through some of maybe it's by god's grace of course but maybe i had he put me in the position somewhere so i was able to do some good for them but this really has the potential of not just changing ourselves but really changing the society as a total to in, to inject some positivity among so much negativity that's that is being projected nowadays therapeutic, therapeutic. thank you everyone Thank you so much, guys. You have been a wonderful audience. Thank you so much for taking your time out. Uh, improv makes for great stories. Uh, if James Bond wakes up every day, goes to work, comes back home, nothing will happen. But what you guys did was you, you were the James Bond who got out of your bed, thought of doing something different today. So you all were improvising today. You being here is improvisation. So congratulations to all of you for being such wonderful improvisers. We have a show on Saturday at Banigala, uh, 6 p.m. You can find all the details on, on Theatre Wale uh, Instagram page and the, and the Facebook posts. And uh, I will also put up a post if, in case you want to join our workshops. Uh, please, you're most welcome. And again, thank you so much. I would like to thank Dr. Jim Robinson for coming all of us. It's funny to call you Dr. Jim. I know. <laughs> and it's sir, well, well, can, can I, I put it? Well, yeah, I, I understand. When my, when and, my mother and writes to me, she puts doctor in quotation marks. So uh, that. And Fiza Hassan are... Whatever. The... <laughs> Please give a big round of applause <laughs> for Fiza. Thank you. One of the last people who are keeping theater live in Pakistan, I hope. And I please support the theater in, theater in Islamabad especially because we we'll need to need your support to make this take it to the next level. Thank you so much, guys. Have a great night. Thank you. And thank you, Fasik. Yes, thank you so much. For being fantastic. Thank you.